Uh, Craig is program manager on WSL uh, at Microsoft. Ben Hillis is the lead engineer on the project. And um, they're here for uh, an intro and Q&A. And I ask that everyone um, submit your questions via the Q&A function built into BlueJeans. Um, if mm -hmm. we get them in the chat, Telegram, sometimes we just miss them. Uh, also, uh, that way, Craig can, and Ben can stay on after their session uh, as presenters without their cam and audio and answer those in the Q&A if we just don't get to some. So uh, with that, we will turn it over to Craig. Thank you so much. Yeah, hello. So good morning for us, at least. Where it may not be morning, yeah. where you're from. Um, but we wanted to thank you for coming out and coming to hang out with us. Really, we have a unique uh, chance here in the sense that all of you already know about WSL. Whenever we go and present at conferences, uh, we talk about, hey, this is what WSL is. Uh, but everyone here is already a user of WSL. And if you're attending WSL Conf, uh, you're probably already super excited about the tech. And so uh, Ben and I kind of wanted to capitalize on that opportunity uh, by having a kind of podcast style Q&A. We wanted to show off some awesome demos uh, of power user tools that you might not have seen before or workflows that you might have seen before as well as our personal workflows, which we get asked a lot about a lot of how we actually use WSL. And um, on top of that, we have some other demos, maybe some sneak peek previews of some features coming up to Windows Insider um, and some good background between Ben and I. So there Hopefully. we go. Hopefully. <laughs> so Ben, I'll start us off. While we get more questions in Q&A, um, how did WSL start? Like where did where did it come from? Because you've been working on WSL the longest on the team. Um, so what right. what is that story been like? Yeah, so so WSL was announced at Build in 2016. Um, and we started working on it about um, I would say two maybe two and a half years before that. Um, so so initially uh, WSL was was a Windows Phone feature. It was a phone uh, for Windows. It was a feature for Windows Mobile um, that I don't want to go into too many details because I think it'll really cause some confusion. But uh, you know, the, I, what I like to say is the predecessor of of, uh, of WSL was a feature for phone, and then we all, you know, unfortunately, kind of know what happened to Windows Phone. And as as that project was winding down, um, we had uh, you know our, our project was canceled. And we were all pretty bummed out about it because we thought it was a really cool piece of technology that we were working on, this syscall emulation thing. And um, we saw this as an opportunity to pivot and, um, you know, continue working, doing the same type of work that we were doing, but, uh, you know, you know, use a different um, a different developer-focused uh, end product uh, as, as, as what we wanted to, to ship. So, so that, was, that was interesting to, to do that pivot. Um, yeah, and it started off with the name Bash on Ubuntu on Windows, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, we all know well, Microsoft's great at naming things. I think we we win <laughs> lots of awards. Um, we're never confusing, never you know, never too verbose. But um, yeah, I mean that that's a name. And initially, it was you know a lot of people ask us why is it Windows subsystem for Linux instead of Linux subsystem for Windows? And we you know there's well. We, you know, uh, the the big answer is legalese. You know, Hayden is a lawyer, so he could he could probably tell you more about this than us. But essentially, what our what our lawyers told us is, don't lead. You know, don't lead your product name with a name that you don't own the rights to. So if if you you know Microsoft doesn't own the trademark Linux, so put Windows in front, not Linux in front. So that's you know that's what we've done. We could have right. done something like like Wine and come up with an acronym that. Um, some other kind of acronym, like uh, we all wanted to call it Linux on Windows, but for for obvious reasons that that didn't work out. Um, right, but yeah, it like, can be seen as Windows's subsystem for Linux. Right, right. We're a, we're a subsystem for Linux applications, so maybe we should yeah. have just made the the name longer, and that you know that yeah. would solve all the problems. <laughs> GNU Linux apps running on right. an application binary interface on Windows. Right. Oh, and, and that's uh, that's the other thing that people say a lot is like, why this isn't Linux? This isn't that you're not. This is everything but Linux. Right. Which is less true with WSL2 because we're actually using the Linux kernel. But with mm -hmm. WSL1, there was literally no Linux. It was it was all, you know, it was it was all GNU user space. It was glibc. It was it was out. It was, you know, 
Ubuntu's user mode bits. It was, it was, you know, most of these new user mode programs we were running. Um, but, you know, like I said, WCL2 is now the actual Linux kernel. So maybe now the name is starting to kind of, you know, it's starting to come into itself. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we have some demos. Um, I'll start with a fun one of just a power user workflow. So I'll share my screen and then we can go from there. So you can see my screen on the desktop. Mm -hmm. Um, and I will open up terminal and open up my Ubuntu distro, which is my default. And I'm just going to go to this copy folder. And interesting enough, I have over here in my Alpine distro, my root folder, just a copy me file. This is something I do a lot because I run a lot of different distros. Uh, and I often need things from one from the other. So I run powershell.exe and then I run whatever command like WSL. Uh, or copy, and then I target my other WSL distribution, so in this case, Alpine root copyme.txe, and I'll copy it over from that distribution to my current folder using interop and the plan nine uh, file server, which is pretty cool. So that's a, that, that was a really fun trick that I saw um, and I, I've been using ever since to move <laughs> files really, really quickly uh, between distros. Right. So you're using, you're using that, we call it WSL dollar kind of syntax, and then you're running Ubuntu, and then that Alpine is, you're copying from Alpine? Yep, exactly. Yeah. And so yeah. you can actually cool. call it directly into this with PowerShell, um, which is really fun. And even if you run, you know, PowerShell.exe straight from here, it actually pops you right into a, a network folder, which is awesome. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Oh, and then let's That's see. Cool. We can run through another demo. Sure. Do you uh, want to you want to do a question like between demos maybe? I was reading yeah. through some of the questions. There's some good ones. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's go. There it keeps scrolling. I lost the one I was looking at. Um. So there there was a question about um about will accessing Windows files from WSL two ever be ever be as fast as accessing Windows files from WSL one, or are things just too different? And, and that's, I think that's a great question. We, we get that a lot. Um, and I think the, the, sh the, the, the short answer is we, we hope that we can get as fast as WSL1. Um, you know, you know, there are more steps involved. Like, you know, we, there's, there's a virtual machine. We, we are essentially having to, to transfer data from the host to the guest in some way. You know, maybe we can use some kind of shared memory thing. Um, but you know, it, it inherently it's a little it's a more difficult problem, you know, because there are two separate storage stacks. But that being said, you know, we're we're absolutely not happy with that performance right now, and it's one of the the big areas that we're trying to improve. Um, and we have some we have basically you know an engineer that it's his full time job to look at that problem, and he's he's coming up with some really cool solutions. So. I hope so. You know, like we're um, we're doing a couple pretty big work items right now that will will make make things a lot better. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the hope is that that eventually will be um, WSL2 will be just as fast on your Windows files as one, uh, or at cool. least you know close, very much closer than it is today. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. I saw a really cool one of WSL is being released soon. What is next? Uh, that's a great question of what's on our roadmap. And yep. uh, the, the general answer to that is we want to look at improving um, WSL2 in the near term feature. Uh, so that's mm -hmm. our immediate roadmap of um, there are some improvements that we can make. Obviously, as Ben mentioned, uh, file system performance is one that we're actively working on. Um, we want to do other things, including uh, network improvements, as well as like new features um, that people have been asking for for a while, and so that's that's kind of our our general roadmap. Um, we are pulling together the exact roadmap for this, and you will be able to see more in the coming months um, exactly what we'll be working on. But that's right. that's yeah. kind of the indication. And that kind of flows yeah. into the other question of, hey, what, what's our plan with WSL one uh, now that we have WSL two uh, is is being released? And the answer there is actually uh, we, we don't really force you to use WSL2 uh, in the upcoming release. Uh, it is something that you opt into using. So the experience that's in Insiders right now uh, is very similar to what you'll get when you, we, we have the general release, which is you'll enable the optional machine, sorry, the optional component virtual machine platform. Once that's enabled, 
you have access to all the command line tools like WSL dash dash, debt dash version, and you can transform a distro to be a WSL2 distro or back and forward at any point. Um, in the future, we really think that WSL2 is uh, kind of the way to go in the future. Um, that's why we're working on it in the, in the meantime. Um, but we're still supporting WSL1, and this is going to be a customer-driven decision uh, eventually, and so it's, it's relying on feedback from the community of, of what this is going to look like. Right, yeah. Cool. Any other questions pop up? Yeah, let's do the next demo, and then maybe maybe we can do a couple of questions in between demos, yeah. and then just kind of, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, sounds good to me. I'll All just right, keep interrupting demo. you. Oh, that's fine. Ah, it's just like work. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> okay, this one's cool. Um, so memory reclaim. Actually, you know what? This might be a good one to do the our my dev workflow first, and then we can do memory. Yeah, yeah, because then um, you'll you'll spin up Docker, and that'll that'll consume a bunch of memory. Yeah. So um, I uh, let's let's see what my, my dev workflow is like. Uh, we're going to show you. This is a demo that I worked on for a video coming out soon, um, and you'll get to see the the fun thing that I made for this. So I made this game. Um, I'm going to start the Docker service. And it uses Docker containers. I said sudo docker compose up. And so uh, I built these two Docker containers. One is a site server that is serving a view app. And the other is a socket um, server that is facilitating connections between different instances of this view app. So if I go and open this, and I go to localhost 8080, you can see my game. And um, what it is, it's really simple. There is a, there are ghosts coming to eat chocolate. I'm a huge chocolate fan. I actually originally wanted to make this Nutella, uh, spelled G-N-U, Tella. Um, but that would oh, be, a, God. that'd be a trademark <laughs> enrichment. Um, uh, so unless Nutella wants to sponsor me, which I will, I will take that. He, he eats <laughs> Nutella right out of the, the jar. It's disgusting. Yeah, regularly. <laughs> so the, the cool thing about this having um, and why it's Dockerized is because these different sessions communicate with each other. So if I hit reset, it resets on both games across browsers. Um, and then if I lose this game in one game, it will lose in, in both browsers. And so that's kind of the power of having um, these two instances talking to each other. I was really fun to develop, especially using uh, Vue. And this is actually what it looks like when I'm developing it. So that's running it at the end of the day. Look at this. Um, but when I'm, when I'm actually doing my dev work, um, where I spend most of my time is in Visual Studio Code. So I will go here, and usually I split the screen out using panes. And I will go to my site on the top one, and I'll run it locally. Um, so I'll run the view CLI service locally on the top, and then I will go on the bottom, I'll go in um, VS Code. And so now I have it just the view part running. And so if I go to my game, um, it's loaded up, but I have a little message here saying connected to server. Obviously it can't connect because there is no server. Um, and so I've left it this way, uh, where just the front part is running locally. And if I want to debug the socket side, uh, I use the debugging tools inside of uh, VS Code Remote, which is pretty awesome. So if you haven't ever seen this before, uh, I might have just blown your mind by typing in code dot inside of a pane inside of Windows Terminal. This has opened VS Code um, with the context of uh, Ubuntu. So actually, let me zoom it. So if, if, uh, if you take a look down here, you can see that there's a, a little Ubuntu um, text on the bottom left. And that is telling us that this is actually running in the context of uh, Linux. So if I hover over this, you can see uh, that I have a Linux file ending. Let's see if I can catch it. No, that's OK. I have a Linux file ending on my files, um, Linux file path. And what's really neat about this is you can debug this in uh, even though it's Linux. So when I go and run this, um, my debugger will actually start this up, and WebSockets are ready for connections. And now if I go and reload this, 
uh, I am connected to my server. And then when I go and press reset, nothing happens because I hit a breakpoint in VS Code. And so this is how I step through um, my connections and I actually debug them this way. What's nice is I get to see all of my variables. Like I just set a you know a variable to show off that yes, this is Linux here called my platform. Mm -hmm. um, but this lets me see what I'm running. And the, the really extra cool bit for me is the, the extension model. And this can be kind of confusing but you have local extensions that are installed on your local machine, like your host machine, which is Windows. And that's, you know, my remote WSL extension. But then you can also install extensions that are specific to your remote machine. So here on Ubuntu, I have the view tooling for VS Code extension installed. And so what's nice about that is when I go and look at my view components, um, they are all stylized and giving me information based off that extension, which is only installed in my Ubuntu context, um, which is pretty awesome. And so that's what it'll look like to run through it. Ben, what is uh what does yours look like? Well, my dev my dev environment? Yeah, I yeah, you know, I'm I'm a systems guy, so I don't do a lot of web um web stuff or you know, I don't use I don't use Docker too much. I, a lot of what I'm doing is I'm writing like I use my dev workflow is I'm writing things for WSL, right? Um, so that's uh, basically it's either going to be a Windows application. So obviously I want to use Windows, like I'm going to use VS Code. I'm going to use, you know, a Microsoft's build system to do that type of stuff. Um, or it'll be a Linux application. And most of the, well, all of the binaries that we ship as part of WSL are, um, are either C or C++. So they're pretty low level. Um, and, you know, don't require a lot of like fancy frameworks or anything. I do use VS Code and VS Code Remote, um, you know, and then I use GCC to build to build things for testing. Um, and, and then so, so that's basically how I use WSL. So it's kind of um, I, I think that kind of shows off that, you know, a lot of the world is doing, you know, app development and web development, back end, front end type stuff. But then there's also like us you know, bearded systems engineers, like the Guilfoyles off Silicon Valley of the world, which, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that there's a lot of different use cases for, for WSL. Um, and yeah, like I said, even, even though I'm doing kind of like Linux systems engineering, I, I still find it very useful. And, and we found people that, you know, aren't even doing coding at all, people that are doing scripting and, you know, are just, more comfortable with, you know, bash scripting. And, you know, there's a lot more examples of, of useful bash scripts uh, that you can find on the internet. Um, it's just, you know, by nature of Linux being such a text-based programming language, there's just a lot of really cool things you can do with scripts. Um, I think that's a re another really cool way that people use it. Yeah, what I find the coolest about WSL is in the sense of, I'm pretty comfortable with the Linux command line. Um, mm -hmm. And when I boot up terminal, I boot straight into Ubuntu and use bash. But I know a lot of people who prefer, you know, PowerShell mm -hmm. and Windows command line. But so many people call into WSL and and then do something and then leave it, uh, right. which I which I find fascinating because I do the opposite in WSL, where I kind of stay in a Windows environment or in, in a Linux environment, and then I call onto Windows. Um, for example, I saw someone made an awesome project. It's all, actually on the command line blog uh, where they they made it so the less commands or grep or anything like that uh, is passed into PowerShell as a commandlet. And so you can actually pipe, you know, if you did in PowerShell, cat whatever file piped into less, it would go into WSL and pipe that file uh, with like auto completion and PowerShell and stuff, basically making it a PowerShell feature. Oh, well, that's uh, pretty, awesome. that's, pretty, that's totally neat, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So there's some other questions I saw. Uh, yep, here's the one based on, Oh, sorry. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. I'm, I've been tracking them. I'm trying to group some of them together. Uh, oh, sure, yeah. To, to, get to as many as we can. Um, yeah. There seem to be a handful, and I think these can be addressed at the same time, questions like GPU pass-through, USB support, uh, supporting Windows RAM disk. This is not the first time we've heard these requests uh, right. in this yeah, so for upcoming new features, right? Like kind of to, to, to bucket that, um, what are the upcoming new things? And really the, the answer there is, you know, the official Microsoft timeline for announcing new features is, is build um, 2020, which is, which is in, in May. May. Yeah. And so um, 
we 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 are abiding by those. And so, if you want updates um, on our GitHub threads, is where we post the most up to date things. So for GPU support, um, we'll be posting anything there, as well as USB passer, RAM disk, etc. Um, but in terms of new features, uh, they'll be announced here. Uh, in they'll be announced there in build 2020. However, right. we will be showing off a sneak preview of a new one today. It'll be yeah, and that feature will, the the one we're showing off will be available pr much much before build. I yes, thought it would be available cool. today, but it's not. <laughs> no. um, oh, very. Cool. Yeah, so that's a good question. Also, Hayden, to kind of to kind of piggyback onto Craig's answer, um, that all of those things we're looking at, like those are all things, those are all on the table. Um, yeah. You know, there it, it, it's a question of prioritization and. You know, some of some of those things are, um, you know, inherently very different in WSL one versus WSL two, um, and so we're focused. And since our focus is WSL two, we're we're looking at, you know, thing. We're we're starting to look at those things and, and like what the right way to do them is. Um, I I had a couple of questions that I found while while kind of Craig was giving his cool demo. Um, these were both from Nuno, I think, um, the WSL Corsair. Uh, and <laughs> so first question was, um, is nested virtualization, uh, you know, coming in the short, medium, long term? Um, nested virtualization basically means running, you know, running a virtual machine inside of the, the Linux virtual machine. Uh, the answer there is yes. Um, that, it, that just got checked in very recently, actually. We have a kernel, our, our, our kernel will support, uh, you know, the KVM extensions and, we have a um, a WSL config option to toggle it, um, so that so that's coming very soon, and it, I I believe it's by default off. So when that feature gets released, to insiders will tell people that want to play around with that how to do it. Um, but yeah, so that so that's coming. So yeah, look look forward to that. The other nice. one is is kind of along the same vein as is is that you know yesterday Steve French gave a really good talk on 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 the Linux kernel five dot probably 5.4, 5, 5, whatever. Um, and, you know, WCL is currently using 4.19. Um, you know, are we, are we planning on revving to the, the latest Linux kernel version? Also, yeah, the answer the answer there is also yes. Um, we internally, we have a 5.4 kernel that we've been testing. Um, it, it, we required, no, excuse me, there, it, it required a couple fixes. Um, so we, uh, there was some of uh, VSOC, there were some bugs in VSOC that were introduced actually prior to 5.4s and one of the later 4.19 revisions that, that this VSOC bug was was introduced. Um, we fixed that and we're pushing it upstream. We can't switch to 5.4 until that's fixed because we use, um, WSL2 uses high, you know, VSOC, HVSOC all over the place. Um, once that uh, once that's done and once once our, our team that owns the Microsoft, the, the version of the Linux kernel that Microsoft builds, uh, then yeah, the plan is to switch switch to five four. Um, so yeah, so that's also coming. And then one there, other question, I can't I can't remember. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Hayden. There was a related question. What, sure. Uh, how much cooperation is there between the WSL kernel team and the Azure Linux kernel team? Right. So my that's a great <laughs> that's a great question. So the goal the goal at Microsoft is for there to be one team that you know, kind of builds all the Linux kernels for, you know, across all the different product offerings that Microsoft has. So uh, WSL, LCAO, um, you know, various Azure Azure projects, um, you know, some unannounced things perhaps. Um, but there are, uh, so my understanding is that that is true, is that this, the, the it's a team called the Linux Systems Group team that that, you know, basically owns the Microsoft fork of the Linux kernel. Um, and yeah, that they're responsible. They own essentially the building and, and feature development and, and, you know, uh, build pipeline for, for that kernel in Microsoft. There, you know, Microsoft's a very large company and I wouldn't be surprised if there was a team here or there that were, you know, that had their own thing that they were doing. Um, but the goal, the end goal is for there to be, you know, one, one Linux kernel team that provides, um, you know, that binary to all the other feature teams that use it. So that's a great question. There can only be one. Yeah, and and one. Well, t we'll do one more question. Um, that how much how much code to WSL two comes from LCAL, the or that that acronym for, for those of you that that just sounds like you know Greek. Uh, that's Linux containers on Windows. Uh, is the WSL team contributing back to LCAL? Uh, those are actually the same team. 
So my, the team that I'm on is uh, our team name is Linux on Windows, and we own a handful of things. One of those is WSL. The other one is LCAL. And then we also um, we contribute to other projects as well. We have a dev that works a lot on, uh, I think right now he's contributing back to QEMU and has, has contributed to the Android emulator and various, you know, Linux uh, projects in the, in the past. So that the LCAL and the WSL team are the same team. Um, and they, uh, you know, sometimes there's some people that work on both that's, but, but primarily it's, you know, I'm a WSL dev. I, I've helped with some LCAL stuff, but pr primarily it's, um, there's the LCAL devs and the WSL devs, but it's all the same team, same dev lead. Mm hmm. Yeah. Cool. cool. Should we jump into a, a different demo while we sure. generate more questions? Yeah. What I, like you got? Setup, I like this setup with Hayden, like, you know, yeah. supporting yeah. us. Yeah, feel free to keep jumping in, Hayden. We we appreciate you. I just I just yeah. I do just want to say that you know this with everything going on in the world right now, this it's very. I was disappointed that the conference didn't happen in person. You know, really looking forward to maybe next year if you know if if it works out that we're able to all meet you guys in person and you know have something that. Mm -hmm. But you know, given given everything, this this is working out great. I think this I think this yeah. is as good as we could have hoped for. For sure. Yeah, what do you, what what do you think of uh, San Paulo in Brazil? <laughs> I mean, that's great. That's great. I'll just yeah. ho hopefully I can right. expect it. I'm sure I can. <laughs> yeah. Can we do it around Carnival? <laughs> what, what kind of year is Carnival? I think it's. Is it? A, I don't know. Is it in the fall? We'll see. We just it's missed around, it. We, yeah, it's around Lent. I think. I think it's kind of like a Lent thing. <laughs> so, anyway. All right. So jumping back to this demo, um, <laughs> we have a. Uh, so I I still have my that was all instance up. And I've left my prompt up um, on purpose so the WSL uh, virtual machine behind the scenes didn't shut down and, and clean itself up. And uh, I've run the command free-h, which will show you how much memory you're using in a human readable format. So in use, I have about 300 megabytes, but I have 1.4 gigabytes cached. Um, mm -hmm. So this is an interesting distinction in, um, you know, I'm sure I don't have to tell as many people here um, but this was news for me when I first started using Linux of anytime you run a file, it, it caches the content, the, the content. So the Linux kernel caches that um, in your free memory, because why not? You have free right. memory. Why right. not use You're it? not using it. Might as well use it. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and so that happens in WSL. And you can see that uh, we have some of this memory cached. And this is out of my total available memory, which is 11 gigabytes. And so... When we go to our task manager, um, you can see there's a VMM process here. This is the virtual machine that powers WSL2, and it has about one and a half gigabytes of memory in use. And so right now, that's mainly because I did a build of Docker containers, and that touches a lot of files, and so it caches a lot of files. Okay. And uh, you can manage this in different ways. We are working actively on uh, improving this part of the story specifically, uh, but we've already made some exciting improvements to the other half of this, which is in-use memory. So if you are, if you ever use a regular virtual machine, um, you normally you just give it, here's four gigabytes, go nuts. Um, WSL is really cool, WSL2 is really cool, in the sense that it, it will shrink and expand as you use it, and so, what we're going to do here is I have this little C program. All it's going to do is allocate a ton of memory. Um, and then once I hit enter, it will free all of that memory. And so when that, what that looks like when I run it is allocated that memory. My VM has blown up in memory size to about four gigabytes. Let's move this over here so we can see it in real time. And then I hit enter and then it goes right back down. And so the in use memory will uh, grow to at the size that you need it. And then once it's free, once it's uh, used up and not in use anymore, then it is reallocated back to your host machine. So your VM will grow and shrink in size. Right. And, and yeah, sim similarly, um, that, that is a pretty cool feature. The, the, we worked on that with, um, I believe it was the Red Hat folks had a patch that they had been working on for the Linux kernel that I believe they called late, did they call cold discard? I can't remember. We yeah, call it one thing, they call it something right. else. Yeah, cold discard. Uh, essentially what that is, is is it's a way of notifying 
the host to say, hey, I'm done with this memory. You can decommit it, do whatever you want. It's just a hint. It, it's not anything enforceable. But um, our our you know hype virtualization stack now respects those hints. And when and when the uh, the Linux guest tells us it's done, we um, we get rid of that memory on the host, so it can be used by other processes on 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 the uh, um, on the host. Um, yeah. And yeah, like and like it, Craig mentioned. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, please, Ben. Yeah. So, so the other thing I was going to say is that the the that cache. Um, there, there, there's two different types of cache in Linux. Well, there, I mean, there's more than that, but but the ones that contribute to, uh, you know, the the high memory usage that people report that they see in WSL. Uh, the primary one is the one that Craig was talking about was the page cache, and that is that's you know the actual file contents of the files you're reading and writing. Um, Linux stores those in in memory, so you don't have to constantly be going to the disk, you know, as a performance optimization. Um, and there's very good reasons why they do that. You know, the, the memory is is fast, and disk, even SSD, is just orders in the order of magnitude at least slower. Um, so, but with that being said, you know, we're we're running in a virtual machine environment. There, there's we have a host operating system that's already doing this, right? So we have Windows has a storage stack. Windows is reading these files in and, and caching the contents. So, you know, so you don't have to constantly go to disk. So essentially, what's happening is we're doing this twice. And we, our team is really looking hard at ways to, you know, use the, the, the data that's already cached on the Windows side inside the Linux host directly. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, will that'll, if we're able to, you know, to make that happen, that's going to be a huge improvement in the amount of memory that the Linux VM uses. Um, and, you know, like I said, we're, we're working on that now. We have some kind of prototypes that are promising. Um, but, you know, no, no ETA on that, but, you know, that's, that's coming. Um, yeah, and if you're if you're um, running into and you and you see this right of hey my VMM right. is high you know the easiest thing is if I just close this window and leave it closed uh, for a minute my virtual machine will close itself it will clean up after itself deallocate all its memory um, and so that will be completely transparent and that's the easiest way uh, to kind of reset it you can also manually yeah. reset it by just running wsl.ac dash dash shutdown. Um, right. Or you can do it in Linux. So we are, there's, you know, obviously Linux commands uh, like this one right here, which will uh, it will sync all your files. So basically syncing between the cache and the actual files on disk. And then we can echo three to this drop caches, um, which will drop all of our caches. So right. if I actually if I run that, um, it will drop all our caches and then our memory will go back will go down. Yeah, it, like I said, it's it's a hint. It, it usually takes a little bit of time. Yeah, um, yeah. If you, if you, it should be like thirty seconds or something. You'll see it. You'll see it drop back down. Um, yeah. So that three, I, since everybody loves magic numbers, I'll describe what that three is. The it's a bit mask, um, and I believe one is the directory entry cache, um, which is I was talking about there being multiple types of caches. I then I only talked about one. So yeah, see the memory has gone down now. Um, the the, the directory entry cache is essentially uh, metadata that is cached for for different files and and uh, you know thing the the UID the GID things like that. Um, and so I think the one bit is to flush the directory entry cache, and then if you set the two bit, um, that's the page cache. And then if you so you know bit bit math, the, you have the one bit set, you have the two bit set. That's three. So that's what that magic number three is. Um, mm -hmm. In case anybody cares, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure this audience, this is the best place to go talk about esoteric Linux stuff. I, I can't <laughs> pretend I'm not a dork. It's not. It's not <laughs> All right, so we go to so Hayden this, with the leaderboards. This is what we're here for. This is what we're here for. So uh, no, we, 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 <laughs> see if there's Hayden. any questions. Let's. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. Um, all right. Uh, so let's talk. Uh, let's back up a little bit and talk. Strategy. I had a, saw a question about attracting Mac OS users. Where yeah. do you see WSL? Like we've seen integrations with code, with uh, Visual Studio. Uh, where do you see WSL continuing uh, here in the future? Like where do you see it going? Great question. Um, and so, really, the you know that's an interesting question of strategy in Mac OS. And I, I don't think it's any secret that at, at Windows, we're trying to make Windows an awesome developer box. 
uh, if you take a look around, and this is kind of echoing what I said yesterday of um, looking at VS Code with VS Code Remote, um, looking at all of the WSL work that's going on, all the work in Visual Studio, um, there's tons of work going across company to make WSL, to make Windows awesome for developing, which includes WSL. And that is kind of in a, that is in direct competition with Mac OS. So, um, you know, Mac OS has had some really awesome uh, developer experiences, and I've actually used a Mac for, uh, for a long time to do some web dev development. Um, and so we're wanting to improve those experiences over on Windows, and that's where Windows Terminal and WSL comes in. And where do, what does that look like in the long time? In the long term, uh, I think that looks like better integration with Windows and better WSL integration uh, and better feature integration. And so obviously, um, you know, the alternative to running WSL is to run actual Linux in a dual boot, right? Like like running actual Linux or running um, you know, bare metal on, on some other operating system. And we want to make that um, distinction, you know, blur that line as much as we can. And so that's improving the integration on, on Windows. So if you use a virtual machine, it's totally separate to your, to your normal machine right now. Um, WSL is, is interesting in the fact that you can run Windows executables and access your Windows files. And so we're looking at ways to improve that. And that's kind of flows really well into our demo of the new feature, um, if that if we want to show it off, Ben. Yeah, yeah, let's do All it. Right. I thought, so like that, I said, I, th I thought it was shipping today, so it was, it was showing off. <laughs> It'll be out soon, don't worry. <laughs> it will be out, yeah, in the next in the next couple of weeks. Couple, over at couple weeks, yeah. Um, yeah. So I have this, uh, speaking of virtual machines, I have this um, virtual machine running in my remote machine. This is my, my dev box at work. And, um, and uh, give it a second to warm up. And uh, here it's running a preview build, so an internal preview build. And I'm going to hide this. And if you notice, I have obviously Windows Terminal, I have VS Code installed, I have WSL installed. What's new is if I go to File Explorer, you will notice something new. And there is a little Linux icon right here. Let's uh, zoom in on that. You'll see in File Explorer, there's a nice Linux icon. You might have seen this before um, mm. a while ago <laughs> in inside of an Insider Preview build. But what's cool about this is if I click on it, uh, you can actually see all of our distros running here. So there's Debian, Kali Linux, OpenSUSE, and Ubuntu. And I can go and click through them just like normal, uh, just like a regular. And so this uses the uh, WSL dollar uh, feature but it exposes it really nicely inside of the quick access menu or the, the left context menu in file explorer just like mm -hmm. onedrive is and so if i want to go in and access any of my wsl files um it's now at the tip of my fingers and really noticeable uh for new users who are using wsl and might not know about you know whack whack wsl dollar uh, right. this exposes that feature really easily for them yeah and this will work in you know file picker dialogues and anything that uses like the standard open dialog You'll be you'll also yep. be able to see that there, so that's that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, Craig mentioned that that was something that we had worked on um, in the past. Uh, it made it out to an insider build, and then we we kind of realized we weren't really 100% happy with it. We wanted to do some more work, but it was too late in the release cycle. So um, we we got the opportunity to finish that um, that works, and and so that'll be coming out pretty soon. Yeah, and that dovetails really nicely into your question, Hayden, of um, that's the kind of stuff we're interested in, of making it as seamless as possible, pulling integration between Windows and Linux. And really, our ultimate goal is if you want to do Linux dev workflows on Windows, we want to make that as nice as we can. That's the goal. Um, and so that's kind of where we see it going. Yeah, the, the other thing I would add to that, you know, Mac, the Mac question, right? Like the, like, I, I think it's kind of four things. One is, one is, I think the, the overall developer experience, which includes, you know, Windows Terminal, VS Code, WSL, you know, Visual Studio, all of the other, you know, window, all of the other more Windows focused dev, dev platform tools. But then also the one thing that we didn't really call out is our hardware. Man, the Surface guys have been killing it. Like the last couple pieces of hardware they've come out with are just incredible. Like I'm I'm using this Surface Laptop 3 right now. I'm not. I swear I'm not just plugging this because I work here. I mean, this is the nicest laptop I've ever used. It's great. Um, 
and so I think that's really, you know, we we are we have some really great first party offerings that I think, you know, you, you put it right next to a MacBook Pro and they look they they you know, they they're both very nice devices. But like the the, the fit and finish that, you know, in my opinion, Mac had was really beating us, uh, you know, five, especially 10 years ago, but even five years ago, I think we're we're right. We're right. On, we're right there with them now. You, you yeah. also use the Surface Pro X, right? I ben? I have I have too many devices. Yeah, so I have I have a Surface Pro X. I I think it's great. You know, it's an it's an ARM device, good battery life. Um, you know, I that I use that commuting a lot. Uh, and so that's really good. Um, I have a I have a Surface Studio. Uh, that's nice. That's also really nice. It's basically an iMac clone type thing, but it's it's a really nice device with a touch screen. And my my kid loves it. He loves drawing on it and stuff. But yeah, there's a lot of really cool devices. The the arm touches uh, in Surface Pro X touches on a question from Jeremy Sinclair, uh, a okay. Windows Insider VP. Um, he asked, "Do you see a future uh, it means of integrating Windows doing cross compilation for the sake of bringing more ARM applications to Windows?" That's a good question. So cross compilation in terms of you know running, you know build, building uh, x x sixty four binaries on on the ARM box or uh, I, I think. Or, uh, knowing Jeremy, I think he's mostly concerned about bringing more applications to ARM on Windows, right? And using w and potentially using WSL to make that happen. That's that's a very interesting question. Um, I I don't, you know, I I'm I'm good friends with um, uh, some of the people that work really closely on on the ARM 64 problem, and uh, I, I will say bringing bringing more apps to ARM to the ARM. Windows platform is is something that they're working really hard on right now, and they have some really cool things in the pipeline um, that I think will I think people are going to be really excited about. It's it's going to be great. So um, I I don't you know cross cross compiling. I think you know I think you're right. Native apps are always going to be the way to go. Um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure beyond that. Um, you know, hopefully we can get people to just build build their stuff for ARM 64. It's usually Pretty simple um, to get things to you know the compiler tool chains in the world, especially um, you know L LLVM is it, you know ARM sixty four support has been there for a long time, so it's it should be pretty easy. Um, so anyway, it's just a it's more a matter of um, you know Electron recently you know and uh, the new Microsoft Edge has a native ARM sixty four version, and I, it's I think it's just kind of happening naturally now that there's products out there that are ARM. You know, if you build it, they will come, kind of thing. Um, but that's uh, maybe that's optimistic, right? Well, that's good. Uh, I think ARM is going to continue growing and expanding. And of course, we have WSL distros uh, that support ARM now. Right. Uh, yeah. Which is very. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Including Ubuntu. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, any plans that you can share with us about uh, Windows 10X? I. Probably not. It's um, <laughs> <laughs> not if I want to go back to my job after the leave. Uh, <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't say as a non Microsoft employee, I have seen Windows 10X running on systems with okay. WSL people by third party people. So, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But I, won't, I won't get Ben and Craig in trouble. <laughs> right, right, right. So, right. So, we're, yeah, it, it's definitely on our radar. We're, you know, Windows 10 X is we're we're all excited about it. We we think it you know it, it's like our it's our future view of of what the Windows operating system should be. So we're we're excited about it. We're all working hard on it. So. Go cool. on. Any other questions, Hayden? Nope. Uh, not. I don't have any right now. Do you have another? Do you have any more demos? Oh, of course we do. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Here's our, we'll, we'll, uh, we have 15 minutes left, so I'll show our last demo, then we can end with some questions. Um, this is one that we get often asked about, GUI apps in WSL, what does that look like? And the answer historically has been, um, we don't directly support GUI apps, so we don't bundle WSL with an X server or anything like that, um, but you can always use third-party X servers to connect to WSL and power GUI apps. And I, I wanna show, what that looks like today, um, even though we don't directly support it ourselves. And so if I have Xming here, which is just a third party open source X server, I'm gonna click one window and then I'm going to click um, no access control. So this one here, 
And why this is necessary in WSL2 is because we have a virtualized context, it's being seen as a different machine. And so now I have my one window open. I'm gonna go here and I'm going to open up my different distro. I put everything on this distro over here for my, my GUI app work. And just the last step that I need to get set up is I need to go to cat slash et cetera slash resolve.conf. This will tell me my name server, which is the host IP address. Um, so the IP address of my host machine. And then I need to export uh, the environment variable display my host IP address zero. This is telling the X server what endpoint it should try to connect to to serve my GUI apps. And from here, I can run things like, you know, XIs, of course, which you always have to run first, or you can run more complicated commands like XFCE4, the desktop. And this will actually start up um, the entire desktop experience, which is really cool. And the, the nice thing about this is in WSL1, because we implemented all the system calls using a translation layer, um, we didn't prioritize for GUI apps. We prioritized for command line apps, making that experience awesome because that's what our focus was on. However, WSL2 uses an actual Linux kernel with all the benefits there. And so GUI apps work significantly better. A lot of the system calls that they use are, are in, way more supported inside of WSL2. So I can go in and open these, um, open up my app, applications, maybe play a game of Gnome Mahjong, um, which is really, really exciting. And that's kind of what it looks like to get set up. You need to make sure that uh, access, no access control is turned on and that you are pointing to the host IP address of your machine. And uh, for reference for that networking bit of the host IP address, we're also looking at improving that. So that's, that's on our rating. Anything to add there, Ben? You're muted, I think. Or my sounds off. Sorry, I was I sneezed or something. I didn't want I didn't want that to right. broadcast. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah, I talked a little bit about um, you know file system performance being something that we're working really hard on and some an area we want to improve. Um, another area is is that networking area. We we think that uh, that is it, one of the areas where there's a lot of improvements that can be made, especially around. You know, VPNs and and ac accessing the WSL to uh, the virtual machine from a, you know external sources and things like that. You know, our goal is is for the networking story um, to really blur the lines between you know your Windows host and your Linux guest. We want it to all seem like a subsystem, like WSL one was, where everything you know seems like it's running on the same machine. And and that's our goal with regards to file system perf. It's also our goal with regards to networking. And we have some ideas of, you know, improving the networking story that it is right now. And, and you know, we're, we're working, we're also working on that. Um, and so hopefully in the future we have, uh, you know, a, a much better, much better networking story for people that are, you know, more happy with, uh, they don't have to mess around with IP addresses. It's just, you say localhost and if you're running, uh, running something in, in Linux or Windows, it doesn't matter. They can both talk to each other. Um, but that's the end goal to do that. So. Yeah, that's good. We had a few questions about networking, things like MS Direct Access, yeah, or NTLM and Curbos. So uh, it's it's on your it's on your radar. We are, yeah. That's one of when I when I think about there's basically three buckets of WSL work that 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 keep me up at night. Uh, and one is <laughs> file system. One is file system perf, making it better. We're not we're not where we want to be yet. We're working on it. The others networking, and then the third is um, is you know general use case like how do we make this thing more more useful than uh, you know just spinning up a VM or dual booting like how can we improve the experience to be you know something more than just a VM running on Windows because we I mean we I, I think you know as as users of WSL and as people that are passionate about it we all we all feel like this is more than a VM this is more powerful it's easier to use it's it's more user friendly. But just giving giving it there more and more reasons that, you know, more and more kind of bullet points that you can say, well, it's better for these reasons. Like that, that's the other thing is just imp you know, improving the, um, you know, the, the interoperability between Windows and, and that Linux environment is, is the other area we're really looking at. Um, mm -hmm. can, you, can you use a uh, couple of questions I've seen about uh, systemd 
and um, SNAP support, which would be dependent on system D. Right. I know in it has been an ongoing conversation. Maybe you could share some of uh, that those conversations with. Um, right. Yeah. So so I, th what I'd say about that is it you know there's not really the biggest issue there around having you know system D or 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 like a more of a, of a real in its system is really just around resource usage and lifetime management of the VM. Like right now with WSL, we since we don't run you know third party daemons unless the user launches them and and since we're you know we we really own the lifetime of the VM and, and the distros. So we can decide, you know, if somebody hasn't used something for a while, we can spin it down. We don't really have to worry too much about the the VM going off and and you know using a bunch of memory and CPU. It's because we we really control the lifetime. But if we move to a model where we have you know potentially multiple system Ds running and they you know they're all kind of reliant on being running to run all these things, it's it, it becomes a lot harder for us to uh, determine when we can clean up resources and. Um, so, so that's not to say this, that it's not going to happen. I mean, obviously, like Snap is an important feature. It's a, it is a bug that Snap doesn't work very well on WSL. You have to jump through weird hoops to do it. So we're looking at it, but it, but it's more, it's, a, it's a hard problem. Um, but, you know, mainly because we, we want to be, we want to have ownership over when we can, you know, tear down the Linux state, and, and if we're running daemons, it makes it kind of hard. Um, so. But yeah, it's, it's definitely something we're looking at. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I saw a question that I that I wanted to answer just because it kind of is it, it's kind of near and dear to me. Um, so I talked to, earlier. I mentioned C and C plus plus is kind of the two main WSL languages. Uh, we had a user that asked out of curiosity, what are your thoughts on Rust? Uh, Rust is awesome. I, I think Rust is great. I I haven't been. There's a lot of people at Microsoft that are looking really closely at Rust. Uh, to solve, you know, primarily security issues. Very, you know, that it's it, it's it's kind of inherently a more secure language. Um, we are looking very very closely at Rust, um, and and I would not be surprised at all if if we, you know, use Rust components in WSL in the future, or if big parts of Windows potentially switch to using Rust. Um, it's it's very it's very exciting. Um, and, and as far as other languages, I Elcal. Um, I know the Elcal team uses a lot of Go. Go is also a really cool language. Um, I I personally don't use Go uh, very often. I'm very cursory uh, familiar with it, but I I know a lot of people on my team do, and they're they're big fans. So so those as far as languages. Some people might not uh, know this, but the file sharing between Windows and WSL is done based on the uh, 9P uh, protocol. We have a right. question. Any plans to use SMB3 instead of 9P? Uh, uh, if I had to guess, this anonymous question might be someone whose initials are named SF, who might have something to do with SMB3. <laughs> uh, yeah, any Simon. questions? Simon. Oh, um, no, 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 not, not Simon. This is, oh. this is one of yours. This is one of oh. yours. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I know the SF you're talking about. It's a great, it's a great question. Um, so 9P, we, we're we're looking at you know what provides the best experience overall right like we want um we we want to have whatever is going to give the, us the best performance and the best compatibility with linux uh 9p was a really good option for us because we uh you know we had a a 9 we the hyper v virtualization stack had a 9p server linux has a 9p client that that worked with it we were able to add a bunch of features to use the same um to extend the 9P protocol to use a lot of the WSL1 isms that we kind of invented, uh, some of the metadata things and mounts options and stuff like that. Like so, 9P was a was a pretty good fit for us there. Um, we we like I said, we're we're evaluating if that's the long term plan. If if we can if we can improve 9P to get to where we want to be um, performance wise, great. If if we need to look at you know, interoperability using SMB or, or some other mechanism. I think that's totally on the table. Um, you know, the at, at the end of the day, we you know we need to use something that is whatever whatever provides the best user experience. And and we're you know we're definitely looking at SMB. So. Mm -hmm. So we've got about seven minutes left before we need to transition to Carlos. Is there anything cool. else, Craig, uh, Ben? you wanted to share before we went? Um, 
Yeah, for closing out stuff, uh, please check out our Twitters. Um, that's where we put all of the latest up-to-date info. So I am at Craig A. Lowen, um, and Ben is at Ben Hillis. Uh, there's also an at Craig Lowen, by the way. <laughs> he's a... Uh, <laughs> He's this he poor, first. yeah. He's this poor premier in Al in Alberta, and he gets pinged all the time. <laughs> asked about Linux stuff, like how do I, how do I, you know, build this kernel or, or make this work with 9P? And he's like, I don't know. You, you need the other Craig Lowen. Um, so funny. yeah, Craig A Lowen, and uh, ask us questions there as well. We're we're there all the time. Um, in terms of news, I know you've been asking a lot about uh, when is this going to be available? When will um, this when will you have this feature, et cetera? The best, best place to see those answers is on our command line blog, which is aka.ms slash CLI blog. Uh, so if you go there, you can see all the news. Um, and please take a look at that in the upcoming weeks. As we come up to our uh, conference in May, uh, we'll have more announcements about WSL2. And if you have any technical issues with WSL, please go to our GitHub. That's github.com slash Microsoft slash WSL. File your issues there. Ben and I are there all the time. I know Ben is on there a lot, um, as well as tons of other community members. Um, Hayden, um, more, a lot of people in this chat as well. Uh, Simon uh, from Docker is there as well um, to help you take a look at your issues and triage them for you. Anything mm -hmm. else to add, Ben? No, you're, that, you know that's why that's why I always have you along when I'm talking because you you <laughs> always you always crush it. I never know. What to say. Like, <laughs> Bye. That. <laughs> and you, you handle all the good technical <laughs> parts. Um, and yeah, and, and thank you so much uh, for coming out and doing this Q&A style um, talk with us. I think it was awesome. It was really exciting for us to kind of see what matters most to you as a community, and hopefully we answered a lot of your questions. Um, thank you to Hayden and Sahini for setting all this up again. Uh, it's been awesome, and it's really, really right. enjoyable for us. Well, thanks for joining us. Thank you for making yourselves available being able to answer candid questions, best of your abilities. We're all looking forward to build uh, yeah. what, down in these insider builds with WSL2. Um, we were able to answer, I think, most everyone's questions. And um, the uh, photo of you playing Mahjong on GNOME is blowing up on Twitter right now, Craig. Oh, boy. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, OK. Well. Thank you for that, and we will be transitioning here in just a minute. Um, and WSL2, uh, we've got a lot of questions about this, and I've tried to answer it. Uh, WSL2 is coming in April. Yeah, yeah. The, yes. We're, it's coming in the next, when the, when the next version of Windows releases. The plan is April. Yep. Plans change, but I, I, it looks like it's going to be April. Yeah, we, we all know about the situation right now in Seattle and everything Microsoft is going through, so I think we all have understanding yeah. of, of what of what you know could happen, but I uh, think um, it's going to be an exciting Windows 2004 in 2020. Uh, so, uh, yeah, 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 I, yeah. I'll chime on to that and just say, you know, it's um, stay safe, people. Uh, it's this is a real thing. <laughs> it really is. It's not. It's not a joke. Um, and you know, do whatever you can to limit exposure to the elderly people in your life. That are the people that are really going to get hit hard by this. So just be, be careful. Yep. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Yep. So thank you, Ben and Craig. And uh, if you want to, a couple things, uh, if you want to stay around in as presenters, uh, you can answer Q&A uh, directly. Um, also, we had a couple requests for some of those one-liners, Craig, uh, that you used. Um, if you could drop those in the Telegram, um, or uh, do a GitHub gist and post a link. That would be super useful. Will do. Okay. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye.